Okay. So, um, welcome to this, our first gallery webinar, and thank you so much for joining us. I'm sitting at home with two spectacular contemporary objects, both digitally fabricated using quite different processes. So one is ceramic here, to, uh, that's by Jonathan Key, and the other in sand um, by Gareth Neal. Both are part of our masterpiece online presentation. The topic for discussion considers the influence of digital fabrication in contemporary ceramics by these two highly innovative and dynamic artist makers. I'm especially delighted to welcome our guest host, the wonderful Glenn Adamson from New York. Glenn is a curator, writer and historian who works on the intersection of craft, design and contemporary art. He has previously, and most notably, been director of the Museum of Arts and Design in New York and head of research at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. Glenn's publications, to name a few, include Thinking Through Craft, The Invention of Craft, and my particular favourite, Fewer Better Things. So welcome to all three guests. And I'll let Glenn properly introduce the work of Gareth and Jonathan and look forward to hearing more about the world of digital contemporary objects. Thank you so much, Sarah. And uh, it's such a pleasure to be with you. Thank you for inviting me to be part of this conversation. Jonathan, Gareth, hello to you gentlemen. How are you today? Very good, thank you. Good, thank thanks. You. Thank you, Glenn. Yeah. So um, you are both among the world's leading practitioners of what we may call digital craft, and that's what we're going to be talking about, and both have a good long run of form in that arena, uh, not only as practitioners, but also as writers and teachers. Um, and I'm really looking forward to getting into that topic with you. Maybe you could just kick it off by telling us where you are, though. I feel like this is a useful ritual of Zoom life. <laughs> um, so Jonathan, can you, can you begin or you're done in your studio, yeah? Uh, what I'm actually, I, this is my clean studio. I'm sort of privileged enough to have two studios, uh, one in the house where I'm at the moment, uh, and then uh, just across the garden, I've got uh, my dirty studio with kilns and where my clay is. And it's about a hundred miles north uh, of London on the Suffolk coast. So right. kind of pretty rural. Lovely, okay. Mm, very nice. And Gareth, how about you? Well, I'm in London. I'm in the East End of London, just off Dalston and Kingston Road. Uh, I'm in my studio. I'm in the workshop element of my studio, which is pretty small. But yeah, I'm just in front of my bench. Um, and there's an office um, just on the corner there. But yeah, I'm in, the, in London. Uh, yeah. Would you describe this as your clean studio or your dirty studio? <laughs> it's quite clean as a workshop goes, but yeah. We can get dirty in here. Yeah. Hear it. Okay. And for the record, I'm just uh, in the Hudson River Valley in my home, so north of New York City. Um, so what I'm going to go ahead and do, guys, is share the screen and look at some images because um, we have some great ones to see. Let's see here. Okay. So um, digital fabrication and contemporary craft. Um, I just wanted to start, um, first of all, by showing some images of your respective works and asking you to talk a little bit about how you got into the idea of digital craft in the first place. So just a little bit of biographical information before we get into the um, slightly technical, but maybe more philosophical implications of having done this. So Jonathan, maybe you could start us off. Um, ceramist who has, has uh, some traditional training, but turned to the possibilities of 3D printing early on by the standards of the field. Can you say a little bit about that? Uh, well, I, uh... I see myself in a kind of very practical, traditional way. In fact, I, I became interested in pottery at school. Um, so pushing it a bit, nearly 50 years of kind of, of pottery. But I've been always sort of balanced between, I, um, early on in my career, I did domestic wear as a kind of income and then did more sculptural pieces, um, you know, as my personal interest. Now I was, might be picking up an accent, born in South Africa, Grew up in South Africa. My first degree was, um, you know, in South Africa. Uh, 19, late 1970s, time of black consciousness out there. I was in a white, it was apartheid government. I was in a white university. 
Um, and the European art training that I was getting was not giving me an answer to the indigenous work that I was seeing around myself. Um, so, you know, so I, I preempt all of this is to say, although that was, you know, sort of, I, I've had a career since then, right from that very early period, you know, initially was this questioning of kind of um, terminologies that us Europeans use for artworks. Um, and right back then I decided to place myself, at, you know, sort of in the world of pottery, you know, pots being international, and also just treating those pieces of sculpture. So I think, you know, that again, I hope helps to give a background to this, that, you know, these are personal expressions that are built on a tradition that is, you know, sort of culturally, um, world, you know, sort of worldwide, yeah. Mm. And so um, having said that, what motivated you to start exploring contemporary technology? Because that would seem to be an interesting pairing with the idea of a kind of global traditional mindset. Yeah, um, I, my interests were always particularly on form rather than surface. I think that if you work in pots, it's something you know, between surface and form, always very much form wise. And um, so for my domestic way around through, you know, for efficiency and all that sort of thing, you know, sort of that tradition you're talking about. But the work that I was particularly interested in was often coil-built work was the more sculptural pieces, being it South American, be it African, be it even early European, very figurative, often coil-built. Um, and uh, then in 1999, I was commissioned here, and so sorry, I moved to the UK 30 something years ago. So anyway, in 1999, I was commissioned by the local library services to produce a CD-ROM about my artistic practice. You know, the premise was 10 artists of multidisciplines would explore this new technology, you know, sort of where that there was. And so I was given a piece of 3D modeling software and it just, for somebody interested in form, it just opened up a whole new world for me. Working in the, in, you know, the pottery ceramic tradition, you, your forms tend to come out the process that you're using, you know, be they thrown or coiled or, or sad books and so on and so forth. But on screen, I was just being able to kind of visualize forms that I wouldn't do. Um, so for some years, I was actually kind of doing my drawing on screen using, you know, 3D software as my sketchbook, you know, as simple as that. You know, when I talk about being practical, it is, not trying to get clever with all this stuff it's just using it as a new tool set i think it's been kind of preempted in the um uh, the opening to this um and uh, so the result was uh, i you know sort of was visualizing new forms and then executing them by coil building by throwing and then cutting up sections and recomposing them so making very sculptural sort of objects um but using the computer almost as a drawing tool at that stage and then 2017, I was at a symposium around using digital technologies within ceramics um, and started speaking to designers who, you know, sort of the first 3D printing was just coming through then. Well, it had been established much earlier, but it was just sort of becoming more common. Um, and I said, I want to get this, you know, this information out of my laptop into physical clay in one go. I don't want to be making molds. And, you know, they were saying, oh, possibly. Anyway, 2017, I got a hold of um, Adrian Bauer, who was an initiator of the RepRap, you know, idea, a self-replicating machine. He was a um, professor at uh, Bath University and said to him, you know, what's the likelihood of being able to use this for ceramic? And he said, oh, you know, yeah, why not? It'll be some sort of extrusion, um, a, um, a syringe type system probably mounted and I'm thinking it's it's just coil building, but computer guided coil building. Mm. And again, that's you know sort of I I don't talk about my work necessarily as three D printed at times might do, but I'm trying to go to that say at that point of saying hey these are coil built, mm. but using you know sort of uh, digital technologies obviously, and that is because the form has been generated in the digital si system in the first place. You know that's how the information is being being held. So the driver is actually the form. Um, and, you know, I'd like to think I'm 
you know, the, um, the process is a means to an end and not an end in itself. You know, I don't yeah. want people to get, you know, sort of hung up. I, I'm not just trying to display work that people go, wow, we, you know, look at the technology and that. I'm trying to, you know, there is, you know, a lot of skill in these pieces, but I'm trying to help them hide that skill. And it's the expression of the pieces that's important. Hmm, that's interesting, that idea of hiding the skill behind them. Maybe we can get back to that. Mm, that's, a mm. of, that's a bit of a provocative <laughs> idea. <laughs> so um, I guess the um, thing to emphasize here too is that you were interested in this before it was really possible <laughs> because I know even 20 years ago, you had, for example, expressed interest in using um, digital tools at the Royal College of Art, but they simply didn't have 3D mm, printers mm. That, that could be used at that time, for example. Yeah, so, so you know, two, it was uh, 2018 when there was that economic uh, crash. That's when a lot of the fab labs, you know, there was between the economy and so socially, um, there was that movement towards fab labs and, you know, sort of with that um, sort of 3D printing and a lot of DIY 3D printing. So it was actually, um, am I getting my dates right here? Yes, I think so, 2008. Yeah. Eight, eight, sorry. I, yeah, the whole time I've been giving the wrong dates, here, haven't I? <laughs> so 2007, seven, I was first interested. 2008 was the crash, and then sort of all the fab labs came through. Um, and then it was, um, I was trying to get into printing and fiddling with syringes. And I remember 2009, I'd been sort of almost analog type printing some pieces. Um, and then Anish Kapoor showed work at the uh, Royal Academy that were those big concrete extruded pieces. And I just thought, I now can't show my, you know, these little porcelain pieces that I've done because everyone's going to say, oh, you've, you've, you've seen the Anish Kapoor, haven't you? Uh, anyway, and that, I, was, I was cool there with that. But anyway, um, it was uh, un the Unfold Design Studio, Dries and Claire, who first really cracked the extrusion printing, mm -hmm. is that they actually, by 2010, um, uh, the Adrian Bauer initial DIY projects were being sold as um, kits. So you could buy a plastic uh, printer um, and uh, unfold with then building these and they put a syringe on top and pressurize the syringe with compressed air and were 3D printing or you know, computer guided coil building. I saw they were doing this, I contacted them, I went over and saw them and we've become friends and we've worked together since you know, on, on projects since then. Um, so that initial sort of print out, as I say, I copied their system, uh, was a self, well, a, a kit built up, but then um, 3D Systems, big international company, flattened, they bought out that company, the little start, British startup company, and flattened those printers. So I actually then I felt, you know, there was enough information online to be able to design and build my own 3D printer. So I just, of a different design, I, I did this um, and that I actually open sourced as an open source project on the internet. So that was 2013, I think, going into 14. Um, and it was uh, literally a glue gun, you know, held in a rig that would plot out the X, Y, Z positions. Now I need to point out there that, you know, one is sort of talking about, so wow, it's a 3D printer and all the technology and there is all that. But back in 17th century, you know, Renaissance artists were uh, dividing up a small maquette in 3D space yes. and using analog techniques admittedly, but scaling it up using the same principle. And all we're doing now is using computation to move a rig around and place the material in the correct place. You know, so I, the, I think very often there's a sort of, oh, it's all this technology, and yeah, it is technology, but I prefer coming from the kind of more a humanist point and saying, we are just building on the sh shoulders of other people and using the, you know, using the technologies are appropriate for the age. Yeah, that's a great point that, um, you know, the, the um, technologies that we're using now ha do have precedence. You already mentioned coiling and, of course, yeah. the pointing machine, which I think is one way of describing that scaling up the process in a sculpture studio is another one. Yeah. Um, well, let's, let's uh, turn to Gareth now. Mm -hmm. And um, I just have the same question for you, Gareth. How did you get involved in um, 
digital technologies as an aspect of your work and where do you sort of enter the story in terms of CNC carving and so on as it's being used in woodworking more generally? Well, I guess from uh, my kind of original woodwork background, um, I was lucky enough, I suppose, to sort of uh, be at a university that had a CNC machine. Being uh, at the time was High Wycombe, so the home of furniture, they'd actually had a cascaded machine out of the, you know, a high, um, you know, big end industrial company. And that was sort of in 1996. So there was a, a flatbed CNCs had been used in, uh, you know, uh, uh, woodwork manufacturer for, for years mm -hmm. and actually sort of it was more access of access to these machines was more of a problem and this thing sort of lay dormant no one ever touched it and the technicians were always fairly scared to use these things uh, but it, it sat there in the big machine shop at university and I managed to convince the technician into sort of firing it up for me. And I designed a chair at that time, one of my graduation pieces that just used a replication of a single component, you know, out of plywood to make a chair. And I think, you know, and from that point on in 1996, I always engaged in some sort of digital aspect, whether that be um, CNC routing, whether that be plasma cutting, whether that be aluminium milling. So using things from an engineering side or a manufacturing side, but there was all, they've always been reductive. So, um, you know, removing material to create objects. So I did that for many years on and off while also playing with hand tools and, you know, chisels and draw knives and very traditional processes. but throughout my my portfolio that uh, you know that there's it touches bases with digital continually really but it was only in sort of 2000 and after my time at Fred Bears who obviously was an, another early pioneer of digital uh, work um, and while I was working alongside him I realized it was very important to start learning the process of drawing on the computer um, though Fred's pieces were drawn on the computer, he'd often fabricate by hand. So the power, that, that kind of in-between bit at that point was missing mm. for Fred, um, although there were things he did make on CNCs. But I realised, I suppose, that, um, you know, at that time that, you know, it, I needed to learn those skills. So I started developing skills on Rhino, which is the main programme I know, not particularly well, I might add, but it's the one I do know. And then uh, weirdly, the, the, the object that started getting me notoriety for digital fabrication was, a, was the AND table, which ironically I made on a table saw without any CNC fabrication. It just happened to have a very digital aesthetic. Yeah. So, and then uh, the George Chester drawers came along and the only way I could fabricate the George Chester drawers was through using CNC um, uh, technology. And I guess at that point, then that's when things harm, you know, harmonied into kind of that, this is what I do. I experiment with different technologies to, to create objects, um, digital technologies, um, and sort of has been the main thruster of my kind of current portfolio or some of the, 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 the big collection style pieces. But actually this, sort of moment now has sort of divided, I suppose, where I've suddenly removed myself completely from my material to the point at which I'm no longer the person doing some of the work or some of the fit finishing. I, I've completely separated from it. And that just happened to come from a company that kind of taken the processes used in 3D printing of uh, car components or cast, casting, sand casting for car components. Um, and then sort of reverse, um, reversing the technology and making those casts permanent. And they approached me and I kind of ummed and ahed about whether the material was right for me and, um, and whether I should or shouldn't do it. And um, I thought, well, what the hell? It's, uh, you know, why not experiment with something that I've not experimented 
with before. And this all coincided with sort of some health issues, I suppose, where I developed asthma through woodwork and I'd already separated myself quite a lot from the making. And in a way that was a sort of, to say it was a godsend is not quite the right thing, but it kind of divorced me from the material. So I was always asking other people to make things for me anyway, whether that be in my own workshop or in somebody else's. So through that divorce, I was always going, well, he's I'm asking him to make that in the workshop and then he's make it, making it from my drawing anyway. So what's the difference if I just ask somebody somewhere else to make it? I just felt there was no difference. So, you know, it was only came down to ensuring the piece, you know, ticked all the boxes that I wanted it to achieve in terms of its visual language and its storytelling. Um, so yeah, I, I went for it with these guys and over the last few years, we've been developing bigger and more bold and more experimental work where we've really pushed, pushed them and him into sort of achieving some, you know, sort of maxing out his printer, you know, and, and really forcing them to, to, to challenge their process and challenge themselves on scale. Um, and, you know, as for the designing side, I, I don't, you know, I come up with the forms and the ideas with a pencil and a pen, and I do some of the initial computer work. And then I bring in a specialist also to help me with the drawing of it. So even at that point, I'm handing over to yet another specialist of their craft to deliver yet further richness to the objects that I'm conceiving with a pencil really, with the most sort of primitive of tools. Just to get two things clear in case people aren't um, uh, following that easily <laughs> with the technologies that you're using. Um, first of all, you've actually gone from a subtractive or as you called it, reductive technique of removing material to yes, an so, so for example, the, the I've got one example here. So this, oh yeah, so there they are on the screen. Yeah. Uh, this was the collaboration with Zaha did where I first got to kind of work along some side, some really amazing, um, you know, digital technicians, you know, at the Zaha Design Studios. And um, through that process, I sat alongside a, 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 an architect, but also um, an extremely talented designer and modeler and said, you know, you do this, can you do this? Can you tweak this? So it's at that point we started having that dialogue where it was about introducing kind of elements or tacit qualities to the object because what I have not liked previously about 3D designed objects on computers, it, not really about how they're made, but how they look was that they often didn't really speak of the hand and didn't really speak about connection with people. And so within these designs, we were really trying to um, uh, sort of work with the texture and work with the kind of dialogue of what the hand would do when a pot was thrown, for example. So the one on the right, you can see the ridges as if someone's put their hand in the pot and drawn the ceramic up and you can see the ridges of the thumb that would be, but yet it's an impossible pot to make on a woodwork lathe or it's an impossible, pot to make on a, a potter's wheel. Um, but yeah, the, the two sides of that, a big wooden lump is put on a machine and then a machine goes over the wood, taking away the internal uh, body of the pot. Mm -hmm. And then the same thing happens with the external of the pot. And then in fact, two pieces are put together and then we have a hollow pot with a exterior, but you know, a lot of waste, a lot of material going up the spout of the extraction units and yeah it's all about removal with woodwork and they're all um with wooden objects all about removal and then trying to create stability yeah. um so yeah then when we change to the sort of digital process with sand it's it's all about additive yeah. um and just one last thing to get clear, Gareth, um, I think you briefly did say this but my understanding is that this is the material that would normally be used to make it's basically used in the casting process, but it's not normally the final output because- No, it's not the cast, it's just a mold. Yeah. Normally you'll design a mold and then they'd pour aluminium or whatever for the car engine part. And then the mold would be broken down, recycled, and then reused to print again for another mold. Right. So you're basically using a molding material as the final 
result. So that's one of the big innovations here is using this the silica, the sand as the as the finished as a, object. As a finished object, yeah. yeah okay. okay, so hopefully everyone's still with us <laughs> out there. Um, and so I, I thought it would be interesting to just look at a few process images, just in case people haven't seen the um, th these tools at, at work before. And of course, you're both working in particular ways as well. So there's a lot of specificity and specialness here. I guess one um, question for you, Jonathan, which this image um, immediately points us to is the question of scale because we might think of 3D printing as a sort of fussy little thing. Um, and I think people's first encounters with it, that generally was the case. We we're talking about a few inches high, but you're obviously working at very large scales now. So is that a process for you of getting up to that, um, that, that sort of process of upscaling? Um, yes, it's kind of refinement the whole time. Uh, you know, the, the same file can be printed very small. And I have a video of, you know, one of these um, Mandelbot uh, pots printed at about five, centime about five centimeters. Mm -hmm. Off to the right in that studio shot, there's a slightly smaller machine that does about you know, 20 centimeter, 40 centimeter high type thing. So there, you know, I'm sort of moving between those scales and it's whatever's appropriate for the expression of the piece. Mm. One of the things that I'm very interested in with digital uh, manufacturing is that the, there is in fact no natural scale you could argue i mean there's the scale of the tool yeah yeah but it but the scale of the body is not present in the same way because of the degree of abstraction i wonder if you have thoughts about uh it. well it is at the time of output um and this was something that really you know kind of came through to me that period back in 99 when uh, you know doing the cd rom working in virtual space there were probably three things that sort of came out of me particularly then was, one was physicality of the material. You know, you just realize how important the actual, in my case, clay material is. Then the other thing is that sense of scale that on screen, things can just zoom in and out, you know, and, uh, you know, as I've said, the same file can be printed very small or, or large. Um, and so, you, you know, sort of I came around back in my physical studio is to realize that it's against, you know, scale is against our own body. And so I was making what I called handheld pieces at this, at that stage, we're still analog sort of thrown and constructed pieces, but handheld pieces, uh, lap pieces. So a scale that would sort of like somebody's head sitting in your lap. And then what, you know, were floor pieces that were much more kind of body one to one. Um, so that scale, and then the other thing that really was brought home to me was orientation, is that again, in virtual space, you have no sense of gravity or weight, um, you know, so that, that materiality is gone. Whereas when you're working with physical materials, they want to tend to sort of sit on a table or, you know, sort of um, um, drop down due to gravity anyway. And, and so I think that psychologically, um, you know, sort of we are attuned to assessing works due to their material and their poise and position and so on and so forth. And, you know, that whole area of embodiment is something that I think, you know, I've certainly become more and more interested in the whole time. Mm. Uh, and it's because of having worked like, like I do. You know, it's that kind of contrast between, you know, working a certain way, it brings up new questions that you need to answer for yourself and then you work through them. Yeah, it's fascinating to think about the fact that because there's no up in digital space, that one of the things that happens when you bring it into physicality is that you have to suddenly decide directionality as well mm -hmm. as scale that occurred to me before. Mm -hmm. I guess another thing I wanted to ask you about, which um, was prompted to mind when Gareth showed the impossible pot, I mean, it's not a pot actually <laughs> um, that's thrown on a wheel, but it's sort of alluding to that and turning it into an impossible gesture is that one of the things that most, if not all people involved in digital craft seem to do is to look for forms that are not possible to create by hand. So it's not just a matter of efficiency or speed or regularity even necessarily. It's also a matter of finding forms that, that you just couldn't arrive at. Um, using conventional analog techniques. And I was wondering if you felt that way about your work, first of all, and second of all, whether you feel like that's a, in a way a valid motivation or how do you think about that as an imperative? Well, uh, you know, Michael Eden is someone who says, so, uh, you know, sort of makes these articles that couldn't be made anywhere, any other way. Yeah. And then one day popped up on his screen, a photograph of a piece of his that had been copied 
and that had been made by hand in China. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you've got to be careful of that. No, I, I don't care where, you know, kind of basically whether it can be made by whatever technique. Um, uh, you know, we haven't got to the point that actually the underlying premise to my work is that I'm working in code to actually generate these forms. And that's really important for the content of the work. Mm. Um, is well, that, you. you know, sort of uh, my background in South Africa, I grew up in an African game reserve and sort of Darwinism and ecology and evolution just makes absolute sense to me. So that, you know, that is the world, the world view I kind of take on. So this interest in form is actually how to generate form um, through code, because code, you know, I was seeing it being used in the sciences, particularly was giving us a lot of answers for how the world works. You know, I like this idea that creatives, artists are doing the same thing as scientists, but whereas scientists are trying to understand the world in a very objective manner, then artists, you know, have the freedom of a subjective attitude to it. They don't have to do that. But at the same time, you know, it's still us trying to understand what the world's about and how it works and express that, you know, give insight into this. Um, so work in the level of code, I can, you know, my, my coding is self-taught, you know, I was, I was rising 50 at the time of learning it. I don't have a background in, in um, science, uh, in uh, computer engineering or anything. Um, and my coding is very, very simple but it gives me the chance to kind of get outside of myself and to go to places that I would otherwise not go. Yeah, it's interesting too that you're thinking about um, shapes like fractals and Mandelbrot sets that have, that well for starters themselves have no scale and do in fact occur mm. both on microscopic and cosmic levels. So yeah. there's also a way in which the, the sort of aesthetic forms that you're finding in these scientific or mathematical structures yeah. themselves literally take you outside of yourself in terms of scale. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, have you actually inquired into the mathematics of it quite deeply? Is that something you're interested in? I, I spend my time finding um, functions and then working up groups of work around that. So the latest group has been around a knot theory. Um, so then this, the series I'm showing here has obviously been uh, the Mandelbrot series. Uh, and then there was uh, a very early group of work that was shown at British Ceramic Biennale, you know, some years ago was uh, icebergs and that's using a, a Perl and noise uh, function. Um, and it's that relationship between something that apparently is random, the Perl and noise is a kind of random mathematical function. But once you start working with it, you realize how out in nature, the way that ice um, melts down or earthy roads is by the very same patterns. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, for me with that kind of Darwinian, um, in, well, whatever worldview, I have no problem with this in that we have evolved out of the very same system. Yeah. So, you know, sort of getting into, and, and, you know, cognitive science is really, finding interesting things in the last, you know, certainly 20 years, if not 10 years with brain imaging and things like this is, is being able to match up the philosophies of embodiment and the actual, you know, the fact of, of how we experience the world through our bodies. And we are part of that the same natural system, you know, kind of out there. It's, it's the wilderness within each of us that kind of intrigues me as, the world, as much as the wilderness in the game reserve where I, I grew up. Yeah, that term subjective nature that you've used, you know, the, the nature that's within us and also projected outside of us. Mm -hmm. I, th I think it's, it, it is worth um, maybe underlining that fact that although the forms that you're both using are abstract, um, they all, they're not actually <laughs> abstract in the sense that they're also naturally occurring. And, yeah. And, yeah, and figurative in most, you know, both of us too. Figurative. So mm -hmm. Gareth, um, you know, just turning back to you, I'd love to hear you talk about that question of vector in the work and, the, and directionality, which seems to me to be kind of your version of what Jonathan was just talking about to do with mathematical structures. And also that question about whether you're looking for forms that arise from the technology that, you, that would just not occur either to your mind or to your hand otherwise. No, I don't think, I think I come about it from a quite a different perspective, really. I think I'm looking for 
I'm looking to find a beauty within the final object that it, it doesn't really matter how it's made. Uh, same as Jonathan, it's it's about trying to find uh, an object that that speaks to the senses really, and how it speaks to the senses for me is um, triggering your 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 eyes and your hand, I suppose. So. Uh, you know, mathematics in a sense is obviously completely behind the modeling software, um, but I doesn't, I don't come across any of the coding whatsoever. I'm not sort of uh, particular about the coding. I'm just looking into what forms uh, we respond to and, and how we respond to them. And I'll go through multiple iterations of objects on the computer before even doing a maquette and then we'll do several maquettes and actually it's at that point when I start evaluating you know my emotional response to the object rather than you know uh, you know through the sort of the visual the visual language of it I mean it's quite again I suppose in the same way as Jonathan's saying it's quite primeval it's just how do I respond to it how do other people respond to it and and how do I, I connect people to it you know a, a, uh, you know, we're trying to connect people here to a sort of materials that are completely alien to them and processes that are completely alien to them. And I think, you know, it's really critical and quite important that, you know, you don't, that, that the object still connects on a human level. And I think that's what Jonathan's saying with his experiences from, uh, from South Africa. But it's also sort of what I'm saying is that we were trying to, I'm trying to design in methods to connect. And, and that's completely separate from how something is made. And it's completely, it's not completely separate. It, it's completely connected to how something looks and not necessarily connected to how it's made. And I think, you know, through a, a, a great breadth of portfolio of making both digitally and through hand making, you know, exercises and research projects. So I think I've, I've got to the point where I realized that, you know, it's sort of the whether it's this machine or that machine or that tool, it, it it's sort of irrelevant. It, it comes down, it just comes down to this 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 reaction of how you actually feel about something, and 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 everybody's different. So everybody's going to connect differently to objects, and uh, you know, I just try and build into my digital programs things that visually connect with people I suppose and I think you know traditional forms are sort of almost etched within our psyche so you know the traditional pot is almost the shape of a human anyway so we're using quite you know whether it be a, a, a classical Roman or Greek pot or Greek form then you're actually you know you're actually the, the vessel is 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 replicating the human figure and I think that's what I'm continuing to do with these pots is I'm still and sort of playing with that traditional form and that kind of body-like feel to an object and just increasing the dialogue within the abilities that I have now been opened up to me in making. Whereas with this reductive technique that you see on this slide, you know, I, I got stuck. I got to a point where I could no longer make in wood what I wanted to make. And, and the new material offered me a way to to, to sort of exercise that design. And I, I qu got quotes and I looked into whether I could do it in wood and I just, I couldn't. So I, I flipped material. Um, so it was, it was never uh, about the, sorry, I've kind of moved out of the question about the- um, No, 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 this is, all, this is a great answer to the question. I, I did want to ask a kind of specific question though, um, because I totally appreciate what you're saying about tapping into these deep aesthetic preoccupations or, uh, you know, responses that people might have to a pot, to a bodily form, to a landscape form, which this kind of sideways orientation makes me think about that we see in this image. But I wanted to ask you about one particular feature of the work that you're making, which is this articulation that you apply to the surface, the ribbing, which you mm -hmm. associated to the potter's wheel and the throwing rings a moment ago. But there's also a way in which you could read that almost as diagrammatic, as like showing the forces of the object and sort of how the thing comes to be something that you would respond to in the first place, which doesn't exist in 
conventionally crafted objects in the same way. Do you see what I'm getting at? Like there's some, there's a way in which it's showing you why it's beautiful as well as being beautiful. Well, uh, I guess it was never, I've never thought of it quite from that angle, I suppose, you know, like with all the, the previous portfolio, like the Georges and the, the Anne's always have this sort of linear language and a, and a sort of reveal aspect to them. And I, I think this, in a way, this texture is sort of may come from uh, how I draw stuff. Well, I know it comes from how I draw stuff because interestingly enough, one of the, you know, when I did the drawing of these pots and sent them initially to the guys at the Zaha team, you know, I'd done all these scratch lines over it and the way I etched with my pencil, they'd picked up on some of that you know, sketching technique. So, you know, it's it's not, you know, a, a language that comes at all connected to the digital. It's completely connected to the a kind of a visceral kind of expression through a pen or a pencil initially. And then we kind of added to, you know, then we realized, well, what size should we make this? What repetition should we make this, you know? And, and then, you know, at that point, we decided it was very important that they were about the size of your fingertips or your thumb. So that, you know, your hand was almost perfectly aligned with them. And at that point, you realize that, you know, there it is, you know, that moment or that gesture that is this pot is the gesture of the hand. And in the same, in the same way, the fins over the exterior of the sand pots are the same. Uh, they just only go to highlight the shapes and the forms as they get distorted within the computer. Because we start with a form that's straight, with the line straight. And as we push and pull and deform the objects and take these uh, shapes into new territory, those lines get distorted and get pulled out of shape and, and go wrong and you get like a, in the same way as a material would react with you, the computer and the lines are reacting with you on the computer screen. So things go wrong and then they kind of like, oh, it all, oh no, the, damn, we went too far and the thing no longer looks right and the lines don't line up. And then you have to, you know, work your way back. And, you know, if you tweak one bit of the pot, so you're, uh, so you changing the width of the, I don't know, it's got the shoulder of the pot, then that will alter the concentration of the lines at the bottom or deform the lines at the bottom. So they almost work as a, as a tool to be reactive against, you know, to give me some sort of pushback within the designing process. Because once the lines go out, the object doesn't look good anymore. You know, yeah. if they kink, it doesn't work, you know. So that's yeah. always the battle is to try and get, get it perfect. It's also, I guess, um, another way of thinking about it is as a stratigraphy, like a layering. And yeah. I wasn't thinking your dad was an archaeologist. Am I making yeah, that's that? Correct. Yeah. So I, you know, I grew up on in arch on, not in, but on the archaeological excavations. You know, from about the age of three, I think I was sort of huh. uh, finding Roman pottery, finding medieval pottery, uncovering Roman skeletons, digging cesspits, and finding finds, brooches. So I spent my whole childhood you know, on Roman digs. Uh, revealing artifacts and of course I'd always want to do the job that where there was a find you know I love the yeah, find yeah. so uh, I wouldn't want to dig back a wall of a Roman villa but my dad would you know say well that's where it's interesting because it's about the society and the social aspect but actually for me it was all about what we could find and you know there's nothing like digging back a skeleton and finding a a brooch or a, a, an earthenware pot with it or a, a same a bit of samian ware or you know so you know it, and my dad was also a, an illustrator you know he was in charge of the drawing office um uh for uh, english heritage so you know i'd sit for times with him in the office or at home there'd just be no end of pots coming into the home and he'd have to draw the the, the section of the pot, the side profile. There was a particular technique to his illustrations, which I think I use in my drawings. And, you know, he always claims that he knows, you know, every silhouette of every pot within a, peri a certain period within the sort of Roman time frame and can date it accordingly and the medieval time frame. So, you know, I, I had a mass exposure to all this pottery at a very early age. And, 
uh, I think some of it's rubbed off, you know, I, you know, I constantly had a bucket full of Roman pottery that I'd find. And yeah, it's one, the reveal, but also the shapes and the forms that, that I, you know, came in contact with. And so, especially the cross sections, you know, the broken yeah, yeah. bits, you know, are, are just as attractive for me as the, as the, you know, because the, 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 the pots that we always had at home weren't, weren't complete. They were always with bits missing. And, you know, and that's where the beauty lied is the, the abstraction and the bit that wasn't there. So yeah, it's hard not to see all that in these works, like the yeah. image that we're looking at now. Yeah, it's, it's also it's kind really of obvious. <laughs> lovely, lovely metaphor there about the, um, the dig itself being the find, like realizing that the process of excavation is itself the, the treasure. That's yes, quite, yeah. quite nice. But um, so, guys, what I now want to do, um, boy, time goes so fast. We only have about fifteen minutes, but I now want to have a little bit of a philosophical chat <laughs> about what the implications of all this might be. And then also, we'd love to invite questions from the audience the last few minutes. So, if you have questions, uh, please go ahead and put them in the Q and A box, and we'll try to get to them at the end. Um, and I'm just going to show some details of both of your works as we talk about this. So um, the first question I had was really one about uh, authorship, seriality, uniqueness, and the status of the object. Because one thing that I think a lot of people bring to the idea of digital craft is that it's different from conventional craft where you have this unique handmade thing that there's nothing else like it. And there's a feeling that with digital craft, you're even if you make only one thing, you're making kind of a sample of an infinite series potentially. And in theory, you could make more of them and they would be exactly identical. So there's a kind of importation of the mass production logic um, that we might associate with the factory that's suddenly coming into the studio. And I wonder what you guys make of that argument and whether you think it's true at all. Uh, do you like that idea of seriality? Um, do you think it doesn't actually work that way? Uh, Jonathan, what, do you, what would you say about that? Um, yeah, for me, it would just be about motivations. I mean, my, my interest is in producing sculptural objects, you know, that communicate to viewers. And the way I work, um, you know, I uh, write little sort of almost apps of code. And each time I run that app, it's going to give me a different form because I'm using a lot of uh, variables in there and um, often uh, randomized uh, variables. Uh, and so it, also with the 3D printing, each time you run the machine, you may as well be running, you know, a different, uh, unique piece. I mean, obviously you could run the same file again, um, but, uh, you know, for me, it's about generating a new work and making a new work each time. Um, and I'm, I'm just not necessarily motivated by doing the batch production or anything like that. You know, it's, it's... What about the internal repetition though of the, the work? Because both of you are um, using forms that have a lot of internal rhyme might be a good word. Um, and it's, it's, it's not obviously just repetition like the same form over and over again, you're developing the form, it's modulating across the surface. But um, that's certainly one aspect that would be difficult if not to say mind numbingly dull in some ways mm. to execute by hand um and i guess in addition to the idea of there being repetition from object to object there's also repetition inside the object yeah i i mean in my case it's i guess a result of the process is to say that you know these pieces we're looking at now the mandelbrot broth pieces it, it's um as you said a, fr a fractal function uh it's got um you know variables to it it's got an r number to it and the more you turn it up, the more busy the sort of virus becomes that is affecting the surface. So at one level, the, the code gives you, you know, the silhouette, the outside. Um, and then the more you turn it up, the more it will then affect small areas. And what's happening here is that, um, you know, an area is infected and then an area within that area is infected. So, you know, I'd like to think that these pieces are very much, you know, sort of uh, an expression of their, of their age here. You, you are being able to see the results of, you know, sort of dynamic mathematical infection happening in physical form in these pieces. Okay. Gareth, what do, you, what do you think about the issue of repetition? Well, I, I mean, for me, this is the wonder of uh, designing digitally rather than making by hand and drawing by hand is that within the computer process, I can repeat and I can repeat and I can repeat. 
and through that repetition, I'm going through uh, no end of scenarios of what this thing could look like. So that for me is the wonder of designing on the computer. Whereas, you know, if you commit to one, you know, and you don't say you only drew it once, for example, on the drawing board, you went through an evolution in kind of old fashioned terms of how we might use a drawing board, then you're executing that one object, but actually the ability to design and draw and, you know, like, uh, I don't know how many, there's four versions there of things that never got made to be the final piece, mm. you know, and prior to that, there was maybe 50 models on the computer of different iterations. And it's that ability to continually repeat the form and evolve the form and tweak the form means that you, you know, when you do finally execute the, the one off or the limited edition, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, you know, it's a, it's a refinement of something, you know, you've not, you know, you've gone through so many iterations to get there that actually that's, that's the, the sort of brilliance of it, you know, and, and yes, then once you've done something you, you could, if you were, uh, you know, these are a limited edition of, of five and, and some of these are like a limited edition of 12. But, you know, I've been through so many to get to that point to just leave it at just doing one, I think yeah. is sad really, because I, you know, <laughs> there's so many people in the world, you know, like 12 is, is not a lot really. So when you uh, think about the millions of people on the planet. So uh, yeah, I don't have any Quobbles. And then, you know, I won't delete the files, but, you know, you just the uh, the buyers and the collectors just have to trust the fact that uh, it won't be repeated again. Yeah. So, so what you're saying is that it's more about optimization and iteration rather than repetition. But but Gareth, um, let me kind of play devil's advocate here. I'm not saying I would say this, but I can imagine somebody saying that that process that you're going through of tweaking is also drumming the intuition out of it. And you're not getting that like first take thing that people often do prize in art and craft. Yeah, what well, I, I um, in some respects, I would agree with them. Um, uh, however, I think I've had enough experience with, you know, and I'm a firm believer of that, that moment of magic, but at the same time, I have those moments of magic on the computer too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, when something goes wrong or something doesn't quite happen or the process doesn't work. And then you get this element of surprise, you know, and through my approach to computer modeling, actually being an idiot at it and not being very good at it means that I make lots of mistakes. And actually I don't, I, you know, I don't think, you know, a lot of modelers, computer modelers will go, right, well, this is what I want to achieve and they'll work linearly to get there. I don't use a computer program like that. I, you know, I model, I play, I'm, it's a creative space for me. It's a place of, uh, uh, it's a fun creative zone where things will go wrong, things will happen, things won't get made you know, accidents can happen. And some of those accidents are magic too. And, you know, you know, I wouldn't have the portfolio that I had if, you know, in fact, many of them are the accidents where you just go too far or you push it to, to a greater extent or you, you do a Boolean and the Boolean doesn't work or you've pressed the wrong button and you've hijacked into another set of programs and you're like, oh, that, that's really unexpected. So yeah. in the same way, you, what, what you can't do, though, I suppose, is, is, you know, once you press the button, you can't stop, you know. Yeah. I've, that's, that's a frustration for me because there are also moments of magic in the making process. So as the reveal happens on the CNC software, you've committed. But it doesn't mean you can't be inspired by those moments that are happening during that making process. And, you know... Yeah as an artist you know everything or as a maker as you know whatever I'm making whether that be a very small project just to make a bit of money to cover the cost of the studio so I will be inspired by that process and it will either come out in a production object that I'm designing for a company or it might come out in one of these art projects mm -hmm. you know it just yeah there's always a next one right <laughs> yeah exactly so uh quite comfortable just to to you know, find those moments of magic wherever they turn up. Yeah. Okay. Well, we have um, we have uh, quite a few questions and just a few minutes, so I thought maybe we could turn to those if that's okay, guys. Mm -hmm. um, 
Maybe uh, Jonathan, I could pose this one to you first from Richard Laver. Um, going forward, do you see digital craft evolving into its own distinct field or digital practices being subsumed into traditional fields like ceramics and metalsmithing, which I think is probably the state of affairs now. So do you think digital craft will have take off and become its own thing? Um, well, I hope not, no. Uh, you know, I always just claim it's an add-on. Mm. I'm sorry, that it's, you know, sort of, I think the often, well, some of the interesting work will probably be when, you know, old traditions are mixed with, you know, new ways of working. Mm. I think it's the mix that will be, become interesting. Um, you know, yeah, you get the question, is this going to take over? No, it's not going to take over at all. You know, I think a lot of making is about personal satisfaction to the maker as much as it is about producing an object, um, you know, almost kind of a therapy. Um, and people choose to do what they do, you know, with those preferences in mind. I think it's not uncommon that it's, you know, the, using a lot of tech is male orientated because the male mind seems to be, you know, drawn towards it. Mm, okay. Um, got a good question here from Kimberly Vandenborn asking about the software that you're using. Um, so yes, a specific question, um, Gareth, whether you're, you're using Grasshopper with Rhino and also whether Jonathan's using the same code, but um, also asks a broader question, which is, do you find any limitations within the software or the fabrication? And are you trying to integrate imperfection into your digital fabrication processes? So Gareth, first, do you want to say a little more about what you're actually doing on the software side? Uh, okay, so just simply on the so software, yeah, there's Grasshopper involved and Maya too, mm -hmm. uh, along with Rhino. And uh, Jonathan, what are you using? I'm using a platform called Processing that is, you know, the coding process and that works as Java code. And it is literally, you know, the X, Y, Z point in three-dimensional space and you manipulate that. Okay. And what do you guys think, maybe Gareth, you could kick us off on this. What do you think about introducing imperfection on purpose? And, well, it's and, done, yeah. certainly something I've been trying to do with other bodies of work. The hack series is where I'm sort of inviting imperfection through the process. So, um, you know, and it's uh, very much, you know, there's 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 beauty in the imperfection and uh, trying to find methods to introduce that through digital technologies is really interesting. And, um, you know, absolutely, uh, I, I've been doing it with the hack series via using wet and green wood. So uh, while the objects sort of drying and moving and being cut on the CNC machine, it starts moving. And then obviously it's still cutting in the same place. So the forms then, the digital forms then start getting deformed and distorted through the movement in the timber. So yeah, I've been trying to introduce that language within some of my stuff myself and I think yeah it's very it's, it's it's very you know it's very hard you know there's certain um research programs that I know are attaching chisels to CNC routers and and, and band saws etc to try and find other methods that might invite you know things to go wrong or not yeah. wrong but like uh different marks of the maker I suppose um Yes, yeah, it's, it's it, there's a there's a space for it. There's more space for it, you know. I'm trying to think about whether that's more dangerous or less straight dangerous than a traditional woodworking studio. <laughs> yeah, the the strength of a robot arm is just quite unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, look out, yeah. Look out it's there, a slight yeah. knot from it will send you flying. So <laughs> it with an axe is something definitely to stay away from. Yeah, um, Jonathan, what about you? Are you intentionally introducing imperfection into your work in any way? Um, no, you know, there are lots of people working in the area of the kind of the glitch in it and actually using the extrusion and so on and so forth. That's not for me, as I say, that, you know, my interest is in the form. Uh, and I, I guess in the coding, you know, as I've alluded, my coding is, is very basic. Within that format I use, there's a play button. So I'm fiddling around with lines of code, press play. And what I'm going to get, I, I, you know, I really don't know. Um, and, and that's the kind of the real interest in it. Um, and uh, so there's a bit of all oh, kind of where's the intuition and in all of this. I think it's important to, you know, kind of think where the word intuition has come from. One assumes instinct. Um, and the codes, those, you know, mathematical functions that I'm using are reflective of those instincts that must be driving us. Um, so I think, you know, sort of there, I'm trying to take my kind of artistic ego out of the work and you know, 
say, collaborate with natural phenomena, with natural systems. Um, and so, you know, that's kind of where my interests lie and not necessarily in a kind of a personal expression in the glitch or in the process or so on and so forth. Okay, well, that's a, a great place to leave it on that point about primal human <laughs> motivation and, you know, the will, will to form and uh, why we're mm. all here talking about this and why you guys are doing this amazing work in the first place. So, gentlemen, thank you so much for that conversation. That was absolutely amazing. I learned so much. Um, I just saw somebody ask whether this talk is going to be uploaded and uh, available later on, and I believe the answer is yes. So Sarah, uh, would you like to come back on screen and um, just um, see us out and also let people know where they can see the work and whether they can see the uh, recording afterwards? Cool. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you, Jonathan and uh, Gareth. I think that conversation really demystified and uh, also celebrated the digital in contemporary craft. It's extremely informative and very exciting. So thank you. And thank you, Glenn, um, for hosting. It's a real pri privilege. Um, yes, everyone, please do look at our website. That'll show you a little bit more information about both the artists and also give you information on uh, the masterpiece collection in general. So I urge you to have a look at that. Um, and yes, I hope you enjoyed our first webinar. Uh, we look forward to having many more in the gallery, lots of talks and films in the future. So thank you very much and goodbye. And, oh, um, uh, thank you, Sarah. Sarah. Well, thank you, will it be watchable afterwards as oh, well? Oh yes, absolutely. We're recording it as we speak. So yes, you can, uh, you can uh, go onto the website and look at that too. <laughs> but thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>